welcome everyone to, uh, is it the first masterclass of this academic year? Right? Woohoo! Yes, this is the first masterclass. And I would like to remind uh, to those that are for the first time at uh, a masterclass that these sessions are about uh, software engineers uh, coming, sharing with you in depth knowledge about a technical topic. Okay? Today we're going to talk about uh, introduction into cryptography and we have Uriel who's going to introduce you the fundamentals of cryptography. This is a, a really good knowledge to have especially if you're going to get to your transcendence, right? Or if you uh, would want to choose the uh, security branch in the advanced program. But overall, this topic is really important for you to just understand or to have awareness of, right? Because every software engineer needs to know this sort of things. Uh, related to Uriel, uh, Uriel is, um, is the site reliability uh, manager at Google. Uh, you're based in France or in Zurich? In Zurich. In Zurich. Zurich. So he actually flew all the way here <laughs> to, to, to talk to you about uh, cryptography. He's a dear friend of Kodam and dear friend of 42 Network. So he truly understands, guys, what you're trying to do, how is the educational model, and so on. So we are very happy to have Uriel over here today. Um, one thing that I would like to still mention is that today we are actually uh, having 10 campuses, 10 42 campuses around the world from uh, Hello Thailand, Morocco, Germany, uh, Portugal, and so on and so forward. Um, we would like to make sure that everybody is engaged. Okay, so a bit of the, uh, about the rules of the games. First, Uriel is going to um, do the introduction into cryptography, the talk. During the talk, I would like to encourage even people from here, or the people from home especially, to go to slido.com, hashtag masterclass, right? And throughout the session, feel free to write already the, the questions that pop up in your head, okay? So you don't have to wait until the end of the session to ask a question. At the end of the session, we will actually take around 30 minutes to do a discussion, and Uriel is going to take the questions one by one. Uh, we will also engage locally over here too with a catch box. So if you don't want to include it in the Slido, you still get a chance to, to do so here. But people from home, slido.com, hashtag masterclass. Hey, too much of administrative work. Let's give a round of applause to Uriel. Thank you, Victoria. Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. Hi, everybody in VC. Uh, so my name is Uriel. Uh, I'm not really a site reliability manager. I'm a site reliability engineer. I manage machines, but not people. Uh, they're, they're much easier to work with. Uh, and I've worked with security-related stuff. I've never been a security engineer proper, but I've been working on security stuff somehow my whole career. Uh, and I've always found one thing fascinating in security, which is cryptography. Uh, and this talk is about why cryptography actually does some really cool and weird things and how that powers pretty much the entire internet. Uh, very quick disclaimer, uh, this is like I'm on vacation so I'm not doing this for work and Google has not reviewed this talk and they have no opinions on this. Uh, so any mistake is purely mine. All right, so cryptography is literally everywhere. Uh, you can't really use the internet nowadays without using like layers and layers of crypto somehow. Whenever you connect to some website, you know, there's a little padlock that tells you this is encrypted and that is good. Uh, whenever you're sending a message on pretty much any messaging app, it's gonna be end-to-end -end encrypted nowadays. That's kind of the, or it should be at least, should be the gold standard. Uh, whenever you're making any payment with a card, there's a whole lot of crypto involved. Uh, whenever you're tapping your card on the public transits, uh, so you can't fake cards, this is signed and there's cryptography involved. And what's interesting is that this is like omnipresent, we don't really see it, right? As a user of technology, system, technology systems, we don't really have to pay attention to it, it kind of just works transparently. And at the same time, we all have some intuition about cryptography, which generally for the lay people around is something like, I can meet with my good friend and we like spend half an hour coming up with a custom dictionary, like we have our own words that nobody else knows about, and then we can speak in some like code to one another and nobody understands us. 
And like we've all done that as kids, at least I did that as a kid a lot. And you know, in magazines, you get like this kind of uh, how to write secret messages. That is cryptography. Um, and that has limitations though, right? Because we can meet for half an hour and make up our own dictionary and then use that forever. But if I want to talk to somebody I've never met or somebody being usually a website or a server somewhere, right? Like it doesn't have to be a person. Uh, I still need to be able to talk to them securely, which means you know, in a way that people cannot eavesdrop on us. But I don't have half an hour to come up with that custom dictionary with them, right? And so this talk is going to be about using math in a weird way in order to work around that problem. But first, a little bit of history. Uh, cryptography has been around for a long, long, long time. Uh, the first known evidence of cryptography is from 1600 BC. Uh, and that was on like actual clay tablets that were encrypted. I'll talk about what a substitution cipher is in the next slide. But that was the state of the art for like about two millennia until uh, Alkindi, the mathematician, was like, hey, we can probably use math to figure out what is in those messages. Before that, the only way to break even like simple cryptography was to find somebody who knew the code and bribe them or like torture them or something so they would tell you how to read that code. Uh, and that guy was like, we can use math for that instead, much more efficient. And cryptography made some progress, but not a lot, all the way to World War II. And two things happened during World War II. I mean, three. Like, first of all, it was obviously a major conflict, and like the fate of humanity rested on doing the right thing. But also, technologically speaking, uh, that was one of the first major conflicts with widespread long-range communication. So before, if you wanted to send some orders to the front line, you probably had to send somebody on a horse to gallop all the way and tell the orders or bring some intel. Uh, that's very slow. In World War II, for pretty much the first time in a large-scale conflict, you had radio pretty much everywhere. And so you could send orders or intel or receive intel from you know, somewhere very far away, a few hundred kilometers away, instantly. So obviously, you know, the military was all over this and used that everywhere because in the military, being able to react faster is super important. But if you're just going to radio something over to uh, your allies somewhere else, your enemies can eavesdrop on that. Like, radio is not inherently encrypted. And so they can just listen in. They know all of your intels. They know your plans. And they're going to beat you. So cryptography was extremely important. The second important thing that happened in World War II is that this was the dawn of computing. Uh, Alan Turing is featured here for two reasons. One is with the team at Bletchley Park, they broke the German uh, Enigma machine, which was the hardware encryption thingy. Like it had a crank and you would type text and it would do some, it was like a typewriter except super complex that would do on the fly encryption for you. It was really hard to break that cipher. Um, but Alan Turing, not just a father of modern day cryptography, also a father of computing. Uh, in fact, the theoretical model for all computers is still called the Turing machine. Uh, and he was like, we can do this script analysis thing at scale using those powerful computer thingies. And that's uh, essentially what the Bletchley team uh, did, and that's how they broke the German Enigma machine, which was probably one of the most decisive non-battles in World War II. Um, and from there, things speed up a lot, right? So just at the turn of World War II in 1945, Claude Shannon defines that thing called perfect secrecy, which is when do we have something that is encrypted in such a way that cryptanalysis just cannot work? There is no mathematical analysis you can do of the ciphertext, the encrypted blob, the, the, whatever you encrypted, that will tell you anything about the clear text or the key that was used. And we'll also talk about how that can work. Um, and the last date I want to point out here um, is 1976. Uh, with Phil Diffie, Martin Hellman, and really a whole bunch of people were looking at a thing called asymmetric cryptography, which is where we're going to get to the weird part of math in uh, a few slides. So first, substitution ciphers. Uh, these are essentially the things in kids' magazines about like send encrypted messages. Typically, in kids' magazines, it's going to be like you replace the A with a square, and the B with a star, and the C with a half circle or something. And you can just write text with those weird symbols. And if you know the mapping, you can read and write text using the symbols. If you don't know the mapping, you don't understand what the symbols are, right? I mean, essentially. Uh, the most basic substitution cipher instead of symbols just uses like a different letter. So 
if you have in your clear text an A, in your cipher text, it will become a B. We say clear text for you know, the decrypted message that you're about to send or that you just uh, received and decrypted. And the cipher text is whatever you encrypted that you're going to transmit where somebody might be listening in. So very easy. You can use that method like anywhere. I just replace letters with the next letter in the alphabet. It doesn't have to be the next letter. Obviously, you can pick your own substitution. Um, and the way you use it, like pretty simple, you replace every letter with whatever matches in your substitution grid, right? What's nice is that this is also very easy to revert. If you're given the cipher text, you just read the grid backwards and you get your clear text. Very easy, and again, we've probably all done that before. This has like some nice properties. Uh, it's easy to use. Um, it's easy to understand. You can tell a kid, this is how I'm going to send you encrypted data, and they will understand that. They'll, they can use it. It's also very easy to break, and that's where cryptanalysis comes in play. Uh, if I go back to this, you can see that in the word substitution, we have a lot of T's and S's, and every single T became a U in my example, right? Now, if you know that you're getting a large text in English, you know that some letters are more um, likely to appear than others, right? And so if you get the big cipher text in English, you can count the frequency of all the U's and all of the F's, and you know that E's and T's happen a lot in English, and you can figure out, well, statistically, this letter probably represents another letter. Uh, in English, you can also do some stuff like many words and in ING. So if you have three letters that happen a lot at the end of a word, that might be ING. So you can do a lot of statistical analysis and figure out what the substitution was. I mean, there are more complex substitution ciphers. This is like the super basic easy one. But that was the state of the art for military intelligence for about a millennium, so it's still worth pointing out that this exists and it works, right? But yeah, easy to break once you start applying some math to it. So let's talk about another cipher that we can use that's also fairly easy, but that uh, works a little better. And I don't know if people are familiar with the uh, exclusive OR or XOR operator, which is just a logic gate. Very simply, it takes two bits. Bits can be zeros or ones. Uh, if the two bits are identical, it outputs zero. If the two bits are different, it outputs one. Super simple. One very nice property of this, if you take any input, let's call it n, and you XOR it with um, x for any x, and you XOR it again with x, you get n back. Pretty simple, pretty self-explanatory. How do we use it for crypto? This is like the most basic building block of modern day crypto is the XOR cipher. Um, how do you use it? Well, you take anything you want to send and you represent it as binary, which your computer already does anyway, but as a reminder, and I'm sure everybody here knows that, text is represented as uh, ASCII values, uh, H becomes 72, uh, lowercase e, 101, et cetera, which of course you can convert to binary, and the sentence hey becomes this binary string here. Um, let's take another string, which we'll call our key, uh, and in that case, that case, the key is KR0G, we have another set of bits, and we can XOR each bit uh, one by one. So one and one become zero, zero and one become one, zero, zero become zero, et cetera, et cetera. That gives us a new string, and that is our ciphertext. This is the encrypted string here. In this case, pound seven SQ is our encrypted string. As I said, you can use XOR to reverse itself, right? So if we take, again, the ciphertext and XOR it with the same key here, zero and one become one, one and one become zero, et cetera, and we get the same message back at the end. That's also pretty simple. Um, you can explain that maybe not to a child because they have to like convert stuff to binary and that's a little complicated, but you can explain that to anybody who's done like three days of PC and they should be able to understand this encryption. So that's pretty, like, that's pretty cool, right? You can build a lot of stuff there. In fact, this is one of the coolest encryption algorithms because this can provide perfect secrecy. If your key is at least as big as the message and your key is random and you never reuse it, then you have perfect secrecy. Somebody seeing the ciphertext can deduce nothing about the key or the clear text by observing just the ciphertext. And this is something that people actually used um, there's a technique called one-time pads, which is I'm going to generate a lot of key material for you. Like I'm going to generate a lot of random ones and zeros. And I'm going to give you 
a thumb drive, like a USB stick, with this random data on it because we can arrange to meet secretly at some point. And now you and have a copy of this same random data. If I want to send you a message, I'm going to take, like, I don't know, 100 byte long message, we're gonna take the first 100 bytes of this data, I'm gonna use it as my XOR key and send you the ciphertext. And when you receive that, you take the first 100 bytes of this data and you can decrypt it. And then we both discard the first 100 bytes of the data. We, we strike it from the record, it doesn't exist anymore. This way we never reuse these same bytes from the key. And that is perfect secrecy, like nobody can decrypt this. Uh, there were some practical implementations of this that existed with actual books of code that would be printed. Sometimes they try to make them look like legit books, like actual, um, like, you know, if you just skim it, it will look like this is a novel, but there would be like certain letters in certain places, and messages would be sent that would basically say like, refer to this page and these words, and use that as like the sequence of letters that uh, will be used to decrypt what I'm going to say now. Uh, this was actually a fairly popular Cold War encryption technique, would you believe that? Um, but of course, that has one major problem, right, which is I need to, if I want to talk to you this way, I need to meet with you and give you this shared key material that we can use. This is practical in some cases, like it, maybe your bank could use that because when you have a relationship with your bank, you're going to first show up at the branch, they're going to verify uh, who you are and they're going to they could give you something. I'll get to the questions after. Um, or should I, should I do questions now? I don't know. Let's see. Uh, with the Zora, I'll go zero, zero becomes one, and one, one also. How do you know if it was zero or one before? You know that because you need the key again in the decryption, right? So because you, I, I can go back to this. To decrypt, so to encrypt, you need the clear text and the key that gives you a cipher text. To decrypt, you need a cipher text and the key it gives you the clear text. So that's why you always have two inputs to give one output. Uh, so yeah, your bank could give you like a hard drive filled with gigabytes of random data, but it's not super convenient for them to do that. But also, most of the time, you're not interacting with people you've already met physically or people you've had a chance to exchange gigabytes of random data with. Like whenever you connect to a website and there's a little padlock, this is encrypted, you haven't had a gigabyte exchange of secret data with them. So we need something more, we need something different. The definition here is what we've seen so far was symmetric cryptography. Uh, these are algorithms that work because we shared a secret key. We shared a secret, like we somehow established that. Uh, those algorithms are like convenient, but there are some more that are more frequently used, the main one being AES. Uh, the nice thing about this is it has some nice properties if you want to encrypt something that's longer than your key, which is usually the case because you're not going to exchange gigabytes of data. You can still encrypt with AES like something longer than the key and not destroy your crypto system that way. Um, but it's still the same concept. We exchange some password or some secret data and then we can encrypt and decrypt stuff together. And that is where the intuition for most people of cryptography uh, stands, right? If we exchange some secret, we can encrypt and decrypt stuff together. Um, what if you cannot establish a shared secret in advance? Like, what if you have to communicate with somebody you've never met, and you still want to talk over a recorded phone line and exchange some secret, like some, some sensitive you don't want to, the world to know? So we had symmetric cryptography, now we have asymmetric cryptography, which is when the sender receivers have different keys. And that might sound weird, because it is. Um, we're gonna go through an actual example, and that's where we're gonna have some math, but we'll talk about the RSA algorithm, which is still in use today, even though it was invented in 77. It's still very relevant to this day. It was invented by uh, Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Leonard Adelman, so RSA is just for their initials. And in cryptography, we like these characters, Alice and Bob. Alice and Bob really want to talk to one another, and they end up in like all these situations where they can only talk with some constraints, like somebody's listening on to their phone line or something. Uh, let's just say Alice wants to send a message to Bob, but they don't have a shared secret, and they're communicating over, I don't know, yeah, a phone line, right? And the government's tapping all the phone lines, and they really don't want the government to listen to them. Bob can generate what we call a public key and a corresponding private key. And then he gives Alice the public key over this recorded phone line, right? And Alice can use that key to encrypt her message so that Bob can read it using the private key, 
but the government, who has the public key and the encrypted ciphertext, still cannot know what is the clear text. And that's pretty cool. How is that even possible, right? Like, that's a little weird. Uh, let's get to the math. So you're welcome to play along and like do the math on paper at the same time, but you can also just trust me on the numbers. <laughs> um, Bob picks two random prime numbers. Um, you know about prime numbers, I assume. Uh, numbers that can only be divided by themselves and one if you want, like we only talking about integers, right? Like anything that has a decimal point doesn't exist in this world. Uh, so they can only be divided by themselves in one, like 17 is an example. So it picks, he picks two prime numbers, P and Q, and calculates N, which is the product of, the, of them. So in our examples, we're going to pick some reasonable uh, numbers, because otherwise it's a lot of digits. But in practice, you'd use some very large prime numbers. And there's a whole field of optimization about finding very large prime numbers. But the important part is it is a hard problem to find prime numbers. And that's what will power this entire algorithm. So we have P61, Q53, and then is uh, 3,233. All right, pretty easy. Bob calculates, oh my god, there's a Greek letter in there, uh, phi of n, which you don't have to call it a Greek letter, it's just a convention, which is just p minus 1 times q minus 1. All right, 3120, easy. And Bob chooses an integer e, any integer e, so that e and phi are co-prime. That means that they don't have any uh, shared dividers, like divisors, dividers, divisors. Um, in this case, I'm just picking a prime number, so I know it's like co-prime to pretty much everything, um, except its own multiples, of course. Anyway, Bob picks E, whatever. The code does that for you. You don't have to like, do this manually. Bob can now share E and N publicly to Alice. All right, let's, let's agree to that. And Bob does another computation, uh, which looks more complicated, but it just picks any integer x so that 1 plus x times phi divided by e is also an integer division. And call that d. And d is kept private. That's the important bit here. All right, that's a whole bunch of numbers. How does that work for Alice? She gets n and e, and she wants to send her clear text, which we call m for message, I guess. In this case, it's going to be 123. Pretty easy computation, m to the power of e modulo n. That gives her 855, and she sends that to Bob. That's her ciphertext. This is the message encrypted with the key, the key being n and e here. What does Bob do with this? He can compute, so he gets 855, but he knows d and n, so he does ciphertext c to the, po to the power of d modulo n, and he gets 123 back. Magic. I just want to take a moment to say, like, this is actually kind of cool. If you don't find that cool, I mean, I'm sorry, there's nothing cooler in that talk. <laughs> but, like, they were able to, like, they can tweet all this data for the world to read, and nobody can actually know what the secrets are. I mean, of course, with those values, you can just enumerate, right? You can try all the small, um, all the small primes and figure it out. But the only way to do this, if you have, like, large primes, is you have to try all the possible primes and all the possible div divisors for, um, in this case, D and N, in order to find what those roots are. And that's very computationally expensive. It takes a lot of computing power to do that. And a lot of modern day cryptography relies on just a few mathematical problems, like factoring integers in this case, that are, I mean, it's very easy to multiply two integers together. It's very hard when you have an integer to know what its factors were. And that's basically like, how this algorithm can stay secure. So again, I can give you my public key on like any public forum. I can tweet it. You can download that key and use like standard software like GPG or something to encrypt the message so that only I can read it and you can send that to me on the open for everybody to see, like the ciphertext of course, and the clear text is secret to both of us. All right, that's pretty cool. It has a couple of uh, limitations though, right? Like anybody could give you a public key and say this is mine. Or anybody can use the public key I put on my Twitter account and send me messages and saying they're you. And how do I know that they're actually you or that they're actually them? So what we have today with this, like what we've shown so far, is confidentiality, right? Messages sent on the wire 
are confidential to the two of us, but they're not authenticated. I don't know who sent them. And to do authentication, we have to do a little bit more magic with this math. Um, when we have an asymmetric algorithm, we can use that for a thing called signing. Let's imagine I generate another public and private key pair, but I switch things around. I share the private part and I keep the public part. I can, only I have the public part, so only I can encrypt messages with that key, but anybody can decrypt them and verify that they were encrypted with that key. Um, I should say that don't do that with just any asymmetric algorithm. Um, depending on the implementation and uh, many factors, this might be a terrible idea. But the conceptual idea, especially for RSA, actually works. So we have a signing key and a verification key. Actually, for, with RSA, we don't need to generate a new, different pair of keys. We can just use uh, D to sign and E to verify, which is the opposite of what we've done before, right? Remember, um, Bob, was, sorry, Bob was using D to decrypt and Alice was using E to encrypt, they can also just use those interchangeably in order to sign and verify. So now we have a new ability. We can verify cryptographically that something was signed by somebody who holds a secret part of a key, right? The signing part of the key. But that still doesn't really solve our problems, right? Because I still need to know that your public key, so now I have a public key, you have a public key too, we can exchange public keys, and now I know that the messages coming from you are coming from you, because you signed them, great. But that only works if we had a way to exchange um, those public keys in a way. This actually was somewhat popular like 10 years ago, they had this thing called crypto parties, and you'd go and physically meet with people and exchange your public keys, <laughs> typically by like showing ID or something. So, and, I'll get to, to uh, that in a minute, but you can also say like, oh, by the way, I met with this person, the public key is this, and you already trust me. Like, if you decide to trust me, you, you now have you know, evidence that I said the public key is this, so you can trust that the public key is this. Um, except that doesn't really scale well, right? You have to meet with a lot of people, and then you have to decide which of these people you trust, and it gets a little complicated. Um, but the concept exists, right? If I have your public key, I can encrypt messages to you, I can authenticate messages from you. Um, so what, I can, what we can do is um, I can send some third party that we decide to both trust, and we'll call that a certificate authority, because it's fancy that way. Uh, I can send them my public key, and it can verify in some way right, that I am who I claim to be. Uh, maybe I have to show up with my ID card, maybe it's the government, so they already know, they already know who I am. Um, maybe if I want them to verify my web server, like the, search, the key for my web server, they can try to connect there and verify that the right web server is answering them. Anyway, they do whatever they want to verify me. And then they sign a document that says, this public key belongs to me, Yoel Korfa. And then they sign it, right? And this kind of document is what we call a certificate. It is a signed assertion that somebody else's public key is that person's public key. And we're gonna get a little bit away from people here because really we're talking about like websites and like browsers and, and you know, systems talking to one another, but it's still the same concept, right? Public key something belongs to google.com, signed by someone. I think I, this is the demo time, right? Yeah, excellent. So um, those CAs, right, we have to trust them somehow. Um, Let's look at the CAs that I do trust. Because your computer is pre-programmed to trust a whole bunch of CAs, certificate authorities, right? And this is how you can connect to any random website, trust their public key and communicate with them, is because somewhere the trust is anchored by the fact that their certificate is signed by a CA that you trust. And you can inspect um, all the CAs that are trusted in your software, on, like on your device, so I'm running on Linux, but this is very similar if you're running on uh, Mac OS. If you're running on Windows, I have no idea where that's stored. So there's this file here, uh, at, at CSSL search cscertificates.crt, and I'm just using awk to parse it. And you can see here, basically, like a list of really a lot of companies that are trusted by default on my system. Uh, I don't think they're sorted or anything. Um, there are some interesting ones, like uh, 
the government of the Netherlands uh, can sign certificates. Now, the important thing here is like, these are not just like any random company, right? Um, doesn't a CA require trust was a question in there, actually. Yeah, I just saw it pop. Um, these companies are held to very high standards of verification, and there's a whole bunch of processes around to verify what they sign, basically. And it has been the, the case in the past that some CAs have signed what we call rogue certificates. Basically, they just lied. They said, oh yeah, this certificate totally belongs to this company. In fact, it did not, and somebody used that certificate to intercept traffic that should go to that company. Um, the thing is, I mean, at some point, yeah, we do, we do need trust, right? Like, trust has to be anchored somewhere. What we do, basically, is whenever a CA company does that, we just distrust it globally, and their entire business model collapses. So, and, and that has happened, right? We have distrusted million dollar companies and made them go bankrupt because we didn't trust them anymore because they did that. So there is a little bit of incentive to not do that, right? Like being on that list is a privilege that, that is fairly easily revoked and you don't want to lose that when you're on that list. And of course there's a lot of auditing and compliance stuff around it and you know, people in suits talking about standards. Um, like they have to keep the, the root keys in certain ways stored in a safe, at least metaphorically speaking, um, because you know if this, if the keys the private keys for the CAs leak, whoever has them can sign anything they want, right? So there's a whole bunch of security that needs to be organized around this. All right, uh, and let's look at another thing, which is how. Um, I trust a random website. In this case, let us uh, trust. Let's let's look at how I trust Codam.com, right? So I can use OpenSSL to connect to Codam.com on port 443, which is HTTPS. And uh, when I do this, it shows me like a whole bunch of data. But actually, the interesting bit is at the top, right? So we have the certificate chain. The website I connected to sent me a certificate saying, "I am Codam.com." And you can trust me because I'm signed by the Let's Encrypt CA. By the way, if you want to provision a certificate for your um, web server or anything, Let's Encrypt is probably the people you want to talk to because it's free. <laughs> but why do I trust Let's, en Let's Encrypt? I don't trust them. Like, they were not in the list uh, that we just saw. Like, you didn't see it because there's hundreds of entries, but they were not in there. But the certificate for Let's Encrypt itself is presented after and it says, oh, I'm trusted by the ISRG, the Internet Security Research Group, specifically their root X1 certificate. But I also don't trust that. Fortunately, there is a third certificate that is signed by Digital Signature Trust Co, whom I trust. And that says, yep, certificate one is legit, it belongs to the ISRG, and it's allowed to sign certificates for others. So I have this chain of trust that eventually gets anchored at some company that I trust. And it's not like this delegation, it's called delegation in this case, it's not like anybody can delegate to anyone else. There's also rules on whenever you sign somebody else's CA to be a CA for others. Um, that also belongs to the set of rules that will make you get removed from that list if you violate them. But essentially, this is the chain of trust. That means that I can connect securely from this laptop to Kodam.com. And I know I'm talking to realcodam.com. We're able to negotiate uh, an encrypted channel that we can communicate over. And then I can, well, whatever I want to do, like whatever I want to send to that website and I don't want the government to know, I can send it that way. Great. Um, so, demo time, yes. There's a couple of extra uh, things to note here. Um, so asymmetric cryptography is objectively very cool. I think you'll all agree. Um, it's also fairly expensive to use. And in fact, one of the, the problems in the demo before with the small, integer, the small prime numbers I picked is that you just can only send a tiny message before uh, the modulo thing makes it overflow. So you need like a lot of computing power to negotiate like a large enough key with this. And we can simply use asymmetric crypto to negotiate a shared secret. We can do this RSA thing, and then we can negotiate uh, a large enough key and use AES, I spoke about AES before, and communicate using that. That's one very good way to do things, and in fact, we, we still do that uh, in some cases, but 
Uh, how are we doing on time? Yeah, we have time. Excellent. So there is another algorithm that I want to talk about today because it's another like, hey, cool, magic sort of thing. And this is the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, which was actually not invented just by Diffie and Hellman, whom I talked about before. Um, this, is, this should be called the Diffie-Hellman-Merkel key exchange, but it's called Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Um, so we don't need to use RSA to establish the secret. We can actually just establish a shared secret without having ever met. More magic. Um, let's say we pick two numbers, and we can pick those publicly, and in fact, ahead of time. We call them P and G. Um, P is a prime, so we'll say 23. G is what we call a primitive root modulo P, which means that uh, G power of anything lower than P is co-prime to P. If you didn't get that, that's fine. You don't have to, because those numbers were already picked for you. Um, these are the numbers for what we call DSA keys in the 2000, uh, 20, 2048 bit, sorry, uh, version. Uh, they're in hex, right? But like, this is a prime, obviously, as you can see. Uh, and this is totally a primitive root modulo P. And like, many people have verified this. So you don't need to actually pick those. In fact, they need to be picked ahead of time and you need to know what they will be in order to do the rest of the algorithm. So like, your computer has those numbers somewhere, and like they're baked in, right? For, and you know, not just these two numbers, but like all the variants for other key sizes, some other algorithms. But those numbers exist, and they're standardized. So we can use those numbers. Um, Alice and Bob will basically do the same thing on each side. Alice picks a secret integer. We'll call it A, and in this case, it will be 4, and she computes PA, which is G to the power of A modulo P, which is, well, in this case, also 4, because I'm using small numbers, so like, they tend to have collisions, but whatever. So PA is 4, right? Bob has B, which is also a secret, and we'll say it's 3. And Bob can send uh, G to the power of B modulo P. That's PB. In this case, it's 10. So they each send this to one another. Now, Alice can compute... PB to the power of A modulo P, and that gives her 18. Bob can compute PA to the power of B modulo P, that gives him 18. Now they have this shared 18. That is a shared secret. Like nobody knows this 18, because somebody who is listening, they have PA and they have PB, but they have neither A nor B. And that makes it so that they cannot derive S without a lot of expensive brute force crypto. And that is basically how every single connection you open to pretty much anything on the internet that is modern enough to use cryptography, which should be everything, like everything starts with a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Because it's very cheap to do this exchange, right? Like it's, it's very simple. The expensive part, which is finding the primes, has been done ahead of time. So you can do that for like almost no computing power. You just need to send like some integers, get some integers, do a simple exponentiation and modulo that's super cheap for your CPU, and now you have a shared secret, and you can use that for AES or, I mean, if you want to send a short message, you could use that for the XOR algorithm we saw, or any symmetric algorithm you want. And symmetric algorithms tend to be a lot cheaper than uh, what we've seen with RSA, so pretty cool. Um, so, okay, I want to do that. I want to do crypto now. Excellent. I. I, I was hoping you would say that. Um, there's a couple of things you can do to try. So the thing is, crypto is omnipresent, right? You use it all the time without necessarily noticing it. It is interesting to use it in such a way that you are aware of it. You don't want end users to be aware of it too much because it's easy to do the wrong thing with crypto. But if you're going to be interested in this, if you want to learn about crypto, try to use it actively. GPG is probably like the gold standard for sending messages. Uh, this lets you generate keys, lets you encrypt messages, sign messages, send them, like, use them as attachment on email and whatnot. Um, go play with this. This is uh, it's useful. You can also sign your commits to Git, which is kind of cool. So you can say, this was committed by me, and you have cryptographic proof. If you're publishing software that people trust, that's actually useful, because they can say, all the code in your GitHub is actually yours. They can verify that before compiling, and they know they're not building somebody else's code. So that's useful. 
If you have a web server, uh, go to letsencrypt.org. They will give you a certificate for free, and now you can have HTTPS. If you have a web server without an, uh, HTTPS nowadays, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> if you're using IM of any form, uh, like WhatsApp, Telegram, whatever, there's crypto in there, but that tends to be done in such a way that the server manages all your keys for you, and you don't have to see the key management. If you want to be a bit more active in managing your keys, and you don't want to trust a centralized server to tell you that my phone just changed keys, and you totally have to trust that. It's not the authorities trying to snoop on our conversations. Uh, Matrix is a very interesting protocol that lets you do some manual key management. You can install, it's also decentralized, so you can federate with other Matrix instances, um, and you get to enjoy managing keys by hand. There's a million things that you can uh, read, but I'll recommend only one, which is uh, anything that Bruce Schneier wrote. Uh, his blog is extremely good about all things cryptography and security. And if you want to read one book about cryptography that will cover all of this, but in much more detail, his book, Cryptography Engineering, is uh, top notch. I really recommend uh, reading that. I have another uh, word of warning. Sorry, I saw some people are taking pictures of the screen. Did you all get that? Okay. Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll have a link to the slides uh, after. Okay, word of warning, really important. You've all seen how to implement RSA and Diffie-Hellman today. Please don't. <laughs> or, like, I mean, do it as a research project, and then do not ever use that. Um, the fact is, it's really hard to write crypto code properly. Like, it's easy to have bugs in it, which is the, the most obvious thing, but it's also very easy to have bugs that you would not really think about if you're not a cryptographer. Um, a common example is, what if encrypting with, a, or decrypting with a certain key, or decrypting certain, um, what, okay, what if I can send you a ciphertext in such a way that when you decrypt it with your key, it will be slightly slower or faster depending on whether the leading bit of your key is a one or a zero, and I can measure the time it takes you to decrypt that, which is very easy to make as a mistake when you're implementing crypto code, right? And I can send you a lot of things that you're going to decrypt, and I can observe how long it takes you to decrypt those, and I can statistically figure out, okay, well, this bit of, the, of your key is probably a one, and this bit's probably a zero. Let me do it a zillion times, and now I have your key, right? So you want to use abstractions. Use libraries that implement the cryptographic primitives for you. Impl they implement those algorithms. They implement key management. Uh, they do all these things in a way that is hopefully reviewed. Don't use just any abstraction. Some random person's project on GitHub is probably not reviewed. Um, and depending on what you want to do, different libraries will have different strengths and different problems. But you probably want to uh, trust actual cryptographers. Um, Bruce Schneier is probably where you want to start if you want to find actual cryptographers. Um, one thing that many people have been burned by is using anything that has to do with crypto by copy-pasting um, code from Stack Overflow to the point that there is a conspiracy theory that the NSA probably put some bad code on purpose in top answer of Stack Overflow. <laughs> because it's really easy to do the wrong thing there. Like, you know, just forget to verify a signature. Like, you're using the abstraction, so you're not implementing the algorithm yourself. You have a signed message, you decrypt it, and you get the bytes, and you forget to check the signature, which means that somebody else could have sent you that message, but you're going to trust it anyway. Uh, don't do that. Or, like, more simply, disabling uh, all the checks and whatnot. Uh, trusting zero-length keys, this kind of stuff. <laughs> All right, uh, that's all I have for today, but I think there's a million questions on the Slido, and I also see questions in the room, so thank you, everybody. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you so much, uh, Uriel. Actually, uh, when I um, introduced the session, before the session, I was thinking, when do the students get, for the first time, in touch with uh, cryptography? And I thought about transcendence, right? Because they have to encrypt the password of a user. Mm -hmm. But then, while the presentation happened, I realized that you encounter uh, cryptography in the shell 00 during your PC when you have to uh, get your public key of the Voxphere, remember? At least because I, yeah. I did the, the PC in, uh, in September, so I'm like, <laughs> I understand a bit. Uh, and I remember during our call, you also mentioned like, I hope you, if I could understand it, that everybody will understand it. So actually I could tell you, uh, I did get it. Yes. I don't think I can replicate, but it's logical. 
I mean, that, you know, that's not the sense. goal. Like, I, I'm, I'm not <laughs> expecting people to walk out of this like knowing how to encrypt stuff. I expect people to walk out of this with like a sense that asymmetric crypto is a thing, a sense that like there's a whole family of algorithms that you can use in certain situations, and a sense that please don't roll your own crypto and use the abstractions. <laughs> and also read Bruce Nyer's book. And actually, I want to, to ask the first question, if I may, before we start. Uh, I mean, you have the mic, the so yeah, exactly, <laughs> you right? do whatever you want. You power. <laughs> um, uh, actually, the first time I was um, confronted with cryptography and the importance of it was actually during COVID times, uh, especially when um, the government and everybody was talking about this uh, Corona Melder. That's how we were calling it in Netherlands. So it's this tracking app for COVID and so on. And there is like a bunch of discussions about uh, the privacy. I was worried myself, right? And then there is this bunch of people that... Um, we're saying like, yeah, but we actually can encrypt everything and uh, it, it's po possible to do it, you know, private in a such a way that, you know, like, yeah, uh, everybody's safe. So my question to you, can you give me an example of the most impressive application of cryptography that you encountered? Like something inspirational, something like, I would like to, to have a better grasp of like, what's the impact of cryptography in our, in our world now? <laughs> uh, that, that's a Difficult question. I mean, the World War II like thing wasn't good enough for you. Um, I mean, okay. I, I think in, in like one thing that comes to mind, and if you ask me that tomorrow, I'll probably have a different answer. But um, the Tor network, uh, so that's a, what we call onion routing. Um, this is basically a way to route your internet traffic with multiple layers of encryption to, through multiple points on the network over the internet in such a way that no, no one point on the internet knows what your traffic is or knows where it comes from or where it goes to at the same time. So at, like the last node will know that it's sending this traffic to somewhere, but it doesn't know that it comes from you. Any node in the middle don't know where the traffic is going or where it comes from. And the node at the entrance knows that traffic comes from you and it knows what traffic is because it's encrypting it for the first time, but I mean, it doesn't know what the traffic really is um, I should amend that statement, but okay, whatever. It knows that traffic's coming from you. It doesn't know where the traffic is exactly, and it doesn't know where it's going. And at no point in the system is there anybody who knows what message you sent to whom. And this is super important because this is a very censorship-resistant system that is used in a lot of authoritarian regimes around the world in order to evade uh, censorship in order to allow journalists, activists uh, to fight for you know, their rights there. And I think that is really, really cool. In fact, you can, if you have any server that's sitting idle somewhere, you can run a relay node or an exit node, the ones that actually send the traffic to the outside. Running an exit node takes some considerations because you're sending somebody else's traffic to the internet, which might get you know, the police interested in you. If you're running that on uh, Kodam's network, it might get the administration interested in you. But running a relay network, a relay node, sorry, only means you're getting encrypted traffic and sending it to some other node, and you're not actually sending anything to the internet, really. You're sending something to another node of, of Tor. Um, if you want to contribute to Tor, that's a very easy way to do that with whatever computer you have that's connected to the internet and has some bandwidth. And that's a really cool one, I think. Indeed, especially in uh, today's world. Like, this is something really needed. We know it all, what's happening in the world. guys. If you're curious about this, the security branch in Codem Advanced, that's your thing. Sounds really cool. Yeah. Shall we kickstart a round of questions from the audience first? And then we're going to look for the, uh, for the questions on the screen. Meanwhile, I would like to encourage the people from home to include your questions over there. Um, I was wondering, uh, Uriel, if you would like me to be the voice of the people from home so I could also read the question. Sure, and we then can you do that, yeah. respond so that you don't have to do... All, all the work and uh, yes, yeah. but let's kick start first with the people from here because I see a couple of hands. I need to grab this super microphone. Uh, one second, uh, one two. Oh, it's working. Okay, wait. There was Christy was the first time. Um, can you recommend like a nice hashing algorithm for hash maps that doesn't uh, conflict that much? Let's say. If you're doing a hash map, you don't. So there's multiple uh, families of hashing algorithms. There's what we call cryptographic hashing algorithms, and 
they're different from the ones you want for a hash map, typically. Um, I don't know which one you want to use for your hash map. Just, I mean, just whatever to your avoid system uses. As, as much as, like, uh, right now I'm using the for null vo, and there are some, there are some uh, collisions happening from time to time. I mean, collisions are a feature in a hash map. If you have no collisions, that's like you're probably oversizing your hash map. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't actually know which one, which algorithms are state of the art for hash map implementation. Um, I know more about cryptographic hashing algorithms than non cryptographic ones, but using a cryptographic hashing algorithm for a hash map is probably a huge waste of resources because yeah, those tend to be very expensive to run on purpose. So you cannot hash like a million values very quickly. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. No. Okay. Um, what do you think uh, cryptography will look like off, uh, post quantum computers? Uh, that's a big question, isn't it, right? Uh, so the, the, the very like, quick answer that maybe like for people who don't know about this, um, a lot of the cryptography that we have that I showcased today relies on the fact that factoring integers is difficult. Um, that's what makes it hard to figure out the key or to like decrypt the ciphertext if you don't have that key. There is this algorithm in the quantum computing world called Shor's algorithm, which uh, theoretically, with computers we don't have today, right, makes it uh, much faster to factor integers. That requires quantum computers with many more qubits than what we can build today, so it's not a concern that we have right now. But it is a concern that the entire cryptography community has been worried about for the past 15 years at least. Uh, there are algorithms that have been proposed that are said to be quantum resistant. In fact, uh, the NIST, the, what is it, National Information, I, I forget where they are, but like the stand, a standardizing body in the US that does a lot of work in certifying algorithms and also uh, certifying, for instance, the numbers for the Diffie-Hellman uh, exchange. Um, and whether you trust them or not, like some people want to say they're an armor of the NSA, maybe they are, I don't know, but like so far, the internet trusts them more than anybody else uh, in terms of choosing algorithms. And they run a post-quantum algorithm contest uh, for the past few years. They announced actually the, I think four, I think it was four algorithms uh, that are in the last round of selection. Unfortunately, one of them proved to be very weak in a non-quantum way. Uh, so they might be very quantum resistant, but it was not actually, like it was broken pretty quickly, which was actually a big surprise to everybody. Like nobody expected that to happen, but there's still more like other algorithms in this competition uh, and chances are they will be the ones that we'll be using as our standards in, I don't know, 10 years or so. Uh, one thing that's important to note though, like just because we cannot decrypt stuff with a quantum computer today doesn't mean we shouldn't be worried about this today. Because it really depends what you're sending, right? If you're sending um, like information about your troop movements in the military, it's probably okay that this will become public in 72 hours because your troop movements can be observed by the enemy. If you are sending a love letter to somebody, it's probably okay that this will be decryptable in 100 years, in 100 years, because you'll probably not be around to suffer from this becoming public. But there are things that you, know, you might not want to make public within a certain amount of time. Like eventually anything can be broken with enough time, right? We can boil the oceans to power the most advanced computers forever, and eventually we'll know that you sent whatever emoji to your crush, right? But we don't want to do that because it's not economically interesting. However, we have to think about future computers, right? So if I have information that is valuable to me today and that will still be valuable to keep secret in 20 years, I have to think about the state of the art in 20 years, and I have to make sure that whatever I can estimate the computers to be in 20 years won't be able to decrypt that trivially, because otherwise, well, that, my secret it will not be safe if uh, somebody has a ciphertext. So uh, short answer, the algorithms that we use today the most, like AES, came from NIST contest just like this one, and AES is a very robust, well-studied algorithm that uh, we anchor a lot, we trust a lot for everything on the internet, I expect that the post-quantum crypto world will be the same. We'll use whatever um, wins this contest. Mm -hmm. 
and it's, it's an open contest, right? Every single serious cryptographer out there is looking at those algorithms. So if there's flaws, we'll find them before we start using them, and then we'll standardize and we'll phase out AES in favor of, I don't know which one, I mean, there's many of them. Um, so yeah, that's probably what's gonna happen. I hope so, otherwise we don't have a post-quantum post crypto algorithm that we can use, and we're in big trouble. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, let me think of how to phrase this. I guess uh, my question is to what extent is blockchain just uh, cryptography used on uh, a monetary system and is the reason that it's proven so hard to scale so far that it's using asymmetric cryptography, which is sort of slow? Uh, that's a very big question. Um, <laughs> So blockchains are not necessarily tied to monetary systems, first of all, right? You can implement cryptocurrencies on top of blockchains. Um, in fact, pretty much every major attempt at a cryptocurrency has been built on top of a blockchain. But you can have a blockchain for many other things, right? And blockchains are not necessarily, like they're not really built on what we've discussed here. They're essentially built on uh, hashing, which I didn't really discuss, but very briefly is, when you have a function that can take an arbitrarily large input and produce an output that is always the same for a given input, but is in the, for cryptographic hashing at least, it is hard to reverse. So um, you might know about like SHA-1 or SHA-256 or the now obsolete MD5. Those are algorithms that, among some other properties, uh, you can give them some inputs it gives you the same output for the, a, a given input every time, but given the output, the hash, it is hard to figure out the input. Uh, you need hashes in order to link the blocks together in the blockchain. Well, you don't necessarily need hashing. You use hashing to do that. Um, blockchains in the Bitcoin sense of the term, really, rely on some other difficult mathematical problem um, and in order for a block to be valid, you need to have a new solution to that mathematical problem. That is not really asymmetric cryptography, although it shares similarities to some asymmetric crypto algorithms. Yeah, but as the user, you, you have your own private key and, your own, and, and there's a public key with your wallet and all this stuff, and signing right. your wallet is a thing, and that's... Yeah, that, that part, I, so I'm not an expert on cryptocurrencies or, or anything in there, um, but I don't think this is the major factor in making it hard for cryptocurrencies to scale. I think the major factor for that is simply you need the entire transaction history of everybody in the universe in order to make a transaction, yeah. which is a lot of data, and all of that needs to be copied into one place to forge the new block, to mint the new block, and that inherently is difficult to scale compared to like, a more distributed system. Thanks. Sure. Um, I had a question regarding um, the certificate uh, authorities. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that there were multiple times in the past where um, a certain certificate uh, authority was removed from the system because they were considered a bad actor because yeah. they, um, they provided the wrong information. My question is, in term, these are million dollar companies you mentioned and there's a lot of uh, economic rents that they would be forgiving uh, or losing uh, for, for doing that. And so in terms of like the opportunity cost for how much money, the, how much money it costs uh, to, let's say, secure the, the network versus uh, how much money it would cost if it was done in a, in a decentralized manner where every uh, certificate authority would check every single, uh, not maybe me, you could divide it by region, for example, but not have one one centralized authority for one specific uh, like uh, website or whatever it is. Wouldn't it be more, I think, I would say, to, I would, for lack of a better word, efficient to have multiple people verifying the same thing so that you would avoid uh, uh, having one person maybe like costing millions of dollars to, uh, to an entire industry. So, so um, what you're suggesting is basically that a, a given certificate will be signed by multiple CAs in order to be trusted. Yes. Uh, that has been proposed in the past. It's not been super, um, like it does, hasn't had a lot of adoption. Um, in fact, before Let's Encrypt, getting a certificate was something you'd pay for. Uh, Let's Encrypt really changed the game by saying like, if we want to have a safe uh, web, we need everybody to have certificates, we'll make that for free. That, that was a game changer, like a really big game changer. 
Um, but getting signatures for multiple CAs is also like more work for website operators and mm -hmm. anybody who needs a certificate. Mm -hmm. um, and also, like CAs at least commercial CAs probably don't want to send business to their competitors. Um, so I don't know that this is a necessarily a solution. Uh, there is one thing that is called certificate, certificate transparency that exists, which basically forces CAs when they sign a certificate to have a unique serial number of that certificate and log it to a public record, which mm -hmm. is actually kind of close to a blockchain conceptually. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's like it's an append-only sort of log, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can, like whenever you sign a certificate, you have to record that ID in there. And now clients will only trust that certificate if the ID appears in the CT log. And that means that you cannot sign a certificate without telling the entire world that you signed that certificate. And now you have uh, what's called witnesses that are listening to that log, basically, and saying, well, it's really weird that the state of this country uh, just decided to sign something for not an administration of that country. Like, why is, um, I, I think it was Iran who at some point got distrusted. Don't quote me on this, but like there, there was you know one country that got distrusted for you know trying to fish uh, like a whole bunch of major tech companies, including Facebook, Google, whatever. Um, I mean, they, they would like hijack the traffic, which would fail if they don't have a valid certificate. Like the browser will say, "I'm not connecting to that because this is not legit Google. This is clearly something that doesn't have a certificate." So like, well, we'll just force certificate because we're a CA. They did that. Of course, that was caught because if you do that on large scale, many people are also like monitoring for uh, certificates changing or you know these certificates like they get renewed. They have a limited validity, but like they tend to be renewed and signed by the same CA, right? Uh, you bet that if like Google or Facebook's uh, certificate changes CAs mm -hmm. and some new company is signing for that, especially if it's something like a government, uh, there's going to be probes that are going to notice and they're going to complain about this. But uh, certificate transparency just generalizes that, right? You can look at all the certificates from all of the CAs. And it's not mandatory for all the CAs yet, so it's a voluntary thing, but it's being rolled out, and I hope it will become mandatory for all the CAs eventually, and the ones that don't participate will just get distrusted. Uh, but that will change this picture as well, because now you don't need multiple CAs to, witness, to declare trust, trustworthiness of something, because when they do that, they do it publicly, and so you can audit the CAs um, a lot more easily. Yeah. Awesome. Guys, let's take a couple of uh, questions from the people uh, at home, OK? Um, the, the first question, that actually there are two votes for it, what exactly makes asymmetric encryption expensive? Uh, it makes it expensive simply because uh, generating a large key requires a very, uh, OK, asymmetric encryption is a whole branch, right? So. RSA is expensive. Um, there are other asymmetric encryption algorithms that are less expensive. Um, also depends for what. But generally speaking, just the mathematical operations that you need to do in order to keep encrypting asymmetrically are more expensive because you don't have a shared secret. And so you need to rely on hard math in order to um, like use your non-shared secret to encrypt stuff. Um, this is especially problematic when you're sending a lot of data. It's always very easy with um, trivial examples, but as you send a lot of bytes, you need to do a lot of um, negotiating for new keys, for instance. So that's a lot of new handshakes, and that can get very expensive. Um, th there's not like necessarily one general answer to this. It depends on the algorithms, and it is kind of a holy grail of cryptography to find a very cheap asymmetric encryption algorithm, but so far we don't have one. Thank you. Um, you already put a bunch of resources on the on the screen, but still the students are asking how to find trustworthy uh, cryptographic uh, libraries. Can you recommend some? Uh, sure. The the honestly the main library for all kinds of encryption nowadays would be uh, uh, OpenSSL or some of its variants like Boring SSL or this um, Embedded SSL. I think it's called Embedded SSL. Sorry. Um, this is, these are like very extensive collection of cryptographic primitives. They implement a lot of algorithms and a lot of features. Uh, there are some, oh, I mean, also it depends on what language you're at, right? Uh, modern languages typically will have encryption support in the standard library for the most common 
algorithms and key formats. And you probably want to trust that if you're using something I don't know, like Rust, Go, whatever. If you're in C, you probably want to use OpenSSL. Um, if you're in other high-level languages that don't have that, honestly, I wouldn't know. Um, but typically, there, there tends to be one clear winner or like a very small handful of clear winners. And when you Google um, like the name of your, of your language or whatever framework you're using and you look for the name like encryption or signing or whatever, you'll typically find things recommended. Um, how do you know the trustful is a much more difficult question. Um, honestly, like I would read Bruce Nayo's blog, see if he talked about it already and said like this is a scam or like this looks serious. Um, okay, there, there are some things, right? Like for big libraries, they will have been reviewed by independent third party um, cryptographers, security analysts, and they will talk about that. They might have a public white paper that's available that will explain this. Um, yeah, that's, that's about it. Would it be an idea to actually mention those libraries in the same slide? And then I, I could actually share it with, uh, with everybody. Yes, that's an excellent yes. idea. Yes. And uh, last question before we go back to you guys, uh, and then we're going to come back to the people at home. Is there an encryption that even with the same key, it will never have the same output? And by changing the key, you'll even change the length of the output. Um, so many encryption schemes require you to use what we call a nonce, which is basically random data you only use once. And that's conceptually gets you a bit closer to the idea of not reusing keys. That allows you to reuse the key by providing this one-time nonce that you're not supposed to reuse. Um, so when you're using that crypto system, you will have different outputs for different encryptions of the same clear text because you'll give a different, like you'll generate a different nonce at the time you're using this. Um, ciphertext size is, what's called the output here, is actually a problem, right? Because uh, if you know that I'm connecting to a website that has two types of content, the home page, which is a few kilobytes, and an illegal video that is multiple megabytes, you'll have to know what I'm downloading. You just have to look at how many bytes I'm downloading from that website to know if I'm downloading the illegal video. So. What we tend to do in cryptography is we do uh, padding. So you'll, tr I mean, it doesn't work in the case where you have like a few kilobytes and many megabytes, right? That you'd have to send many megabytes in all type, in, in all cases. That's not practical. But you can do things like add padding so that all of your um, messages that you send are the same size. And that gives you like, that removes one hint for somebody eavesdropping which is the hint of how many bytes were in the crypto, uh, in the, the ciphertext. And from that, they could deduce maybe how many bytes, or at least approximately how many bytes were in the clear text. Actually, the next question is really interesting too, and it seems that this is given by the people that are at Transcendence right now. <laughs> it's, uh, how does hashing work? How is the length of the passwords changed during the hashing process? And then we are back um, to you guys. So whoever wants to do the catch box, you can do it, okay? So hashing, like there's many ways you can do hashing. Um, the non-cryptographic hashing, you can do simple things like take the first n bytes of the input and sort them all together and that gives you a number, right? Um, that's not cryptographically sound because inputs are not always random, right? But that works for uh, the hash map problem that we were discussing earlier. For cryptographic hashing, um, I, honestly, I don't think we have time to go over like SHA-1 or something, but they tend to use um, a bunch of operations. So they use ZOR a lot. Like if you look at their diagrams, they will show how these algorithms work. And whenever you see a, a circle with a plus in the middle, that's ZOR, and you'll see that everywhere but they tend to use uh, tables of known values ahead of time that are computed in certain ways to have certain properties. They tend to use uh, permutation, so you'll have your data as like series of bytes, and the table will tell you how to do a permutation of those bytes in order, and then you'll XOR that with some other table and then do more permutation. 
And also, uh, there are rules about padding, which are very important in there, right? So you will typically pad your input to be a multiple of a certain size, and then you can do all these permutations and this zoring according to these tables. And those things are done in such a way that they are hard to reverse. So that's what makes it a cryptographic hash. Given the output, you cannot figure out the input, uh, at least not without a lot of computing power. Sorry, I know this is not like the level of detail that this question is hoping for. Uh, what I can say is that actually the Wikipedia pages are surprisingly good for some of the hashing algorithms. You have to do a bit of, like, you have to ignore a little, like, all the Greek letters and the mathematical jargon that uh, I personally do not understand. But you can look at the diagrams and get an idea of how that works. There are also, um, for MD5, there is a website, and I forget the URL, but I can probably find it again after this talk, that will show you exactly the steps. So you type an input, and it will show you, OK, this is your input transformed into blocks. This is where we had the padding. This is when we do permutation. And you have a visual representation of the algorithm at work, and eventually it gives you the, the output. So that's actually very cool. MD5 is not too hard. Like you can, I'm pretty sure everybody in this room can implement it if you, if you take like a day or two. Thank you. Let's uh, take an other questions from the, from the audience. Where is the microphone? Oh, yeah. Uh, can you <laughs> give it first to Christy and then I go back to you? Thank you. Uh, if you showed us like a list of uh, authorities that can sign, well, that are trusted, does that go for hardware as well? for an operating system. Let's say that uh, I close my laptop, blah, blah, blah. Someone takes it, and then they change something in my computer. And then when you boot back, there is a change in, on my hardware that, let's say, might uh, infiltrate the, the data. Um, so. That's going to be a different type of trust, right? So these uh, things I, I showed were for like network connections, typically HTTPS, but like that can be other protocols. Um, but this is actually a very good question. Like you have other forms of trust, and including in booting your laptop. Uh, the keyword you want to Google is secure boot for this. Now this works in a bunch of ways, but uh, the short answer your computer probably nowadays contains a chip, like a small processor that we call a TPM, the Trusted Platform Module. This is a processor that does almost nothing but crypto operations. And importantly, it keeps keys inside. Like it doesn't put those keys on disk or in the RAM. Like you ask it, hey, can you encrypt this using that key? And it gives you the ciphertext, but you never see the keys outside of this. And they're made to be, to some extent, temper resistant to physical attacks. Now, they also, um, at least the TPM2 standard, has this notion of attestation. And without going into uh, a lot of details, this allows the TPM to say, I will unlock this key only if the processor, the main processor, has booted in certain ways. And it has loaded certain blobs, like my bootloader and my kernel, are the right ones. And so you can say, um, the, like, your, your main disk is probably encrypted on a laptop nowadays. If it's not, you really should encrypt it. If you're on Linux, use Lux. It's excellent software. Um, but you need a key to decrypt that. And if your key is sitting on the disk next to an encrypted partition, you're not doing anything useful, right? So what you do instead, um, and honestly, Linux is not doing super great at this at the moment, but I think Windows has the like, best disk encryption uh, process right now, where they sign their bootloader, like Microsoft signs it, right, before they ship it to you via Windows Update. And they sign their kernel, and they sign whatever code is needed to decrypt the disk. And then they tell the TPM, you can only unlock the key for the disk decryption if the booted kernel was signed by this public key we gave you, right? And so you have a chain of trust all the way because you installed that public key that is essentially your root of trust in your TPM. Well, and Simplifying, but like you told the TPM to trust that specific public key. Um, and th that's harder to do if you're building your own bootloader or your own bootloader configs, which is part of why it's a hard problem on Linux at the moment. But in this case, we're not trusting like the list of CAs that you saw there, right? Uh, they are, there's another list that is trusted, and typically it's going to be like 
Intel for their own um, uh, CPU update system. Microsoft will be for their own bootloader, etc. But you can you can add your own. Uh, if you're running as root on your machine, you can say like, I want my TPM to trust this key during the secure boot process. Uh, I just wanted to move away from cryptography just for a second and ask you a little bit about your background. I'm really curious as to like uh, um, a few questions like how old were you when you first started coding? What type of educational background do you have? Uh, uh, how did you get into Google? The questions like sure. that. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not the best example because I started coding when I was eight. Uh, for a silly reason, my, my dad had this computer at home that he was using for work and I really wanted to play games. And he was like, there are no games on this, but here's this thing called Quick Basic. You can make games with that. And I guess I was patient at the time. I'm not anymore. But like, I was like, well, I can just copy paste from the help file and make some stuff happen. So I started coding pretty early. Um, then education-wise, I attended a school called Epitech, which uh, may, some of you may know because um, it sort of forked into 42. And then that gave the 42 network. And, um, so I did that, and I did a very similar curriculum to what you are doing nowadays. Uh, so I know, like, I did my mini shell as well, and I suffered <laughs> through it, and like a lot of these projects. In fact, uh, fun fact, uh, you know how all the PDFs for all the subjects that you have to do? I, I made the, the template for that. Uh, <laughs> As, as a procrastination project when I was working on some report a long time ago, and then that got copied and like, eventually became the, the 42 network one. Um, so, uh, why I'm saying that is not just to brag, but also to point out that like, I come from a background that is similar to the background that you have, so things that I did are probably applicable to uh, all of you. Um, how I got into Google, I, honestly, I was a bit lucky that I got referred for an internship by somebody I knew there. Um, and so I did the first internship uh, as a site reliability engineer in Dublin. And then I went back to study because I wasn't done with my studies. So I did the second internship as a um, software engineer in the Mountain View headquarters. Uh, I decided I liked being a reliability engineer better. So I joined full time a bit later, uh, but in Zurich as a site reliability engineer. Then I moved back again to uh, the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area. Then I left Google, and then I came back to Google in Zurich again. <laughs> I have a very checkered history with them. Uh, but basically, I got into security. I've always been interested in security for as long as I was doing stuff with computers. Back in middle school, I was buying this like hacking magazines. And they had like CD-ROMs with uh, hacking software on it. That was so cool. I was so elite. Um, but I could, didn't really get much done back then, because like, it was hard to learn stuff like, in practice. Um, but basically, because I had this interest, I kept gravitating around like security-related security related stuff at work and outside of work. Uh, one thing that taught me a lot um, was this thing called Capture the Flags. Uh, they're basically interactive exercises or often competition, like contests, where you're given a bunch of like vulnerable targets that you have to hack and exploit in order to typically get some secret string that's store, stored in the service or in the program. And uh, there are some that are super uh, interesting uh, that are also very like tutorial-like. Um, uh, Over the Wire is one that like many of you can probably do like nowadays. Uh, and I know some are doing it today, so like that's cool. But like really try to do that if you're interested in security. Uh, because that will teach you how to exploit some like basic categories of vulnerabilities in software. And you'll have to do that because you want to do like offensive security, because you, you want to be like a paid hacker as your day job. Although if, that, if you want to do that, that's really cool, right? But like even if you don't want to do that, doing that gives you, like doing the CTFs, gives you a lot of understanding of why some things that you might do in your code that look innocent or not dangerous are actually dangerous. Like, uh, I don't want to bother allocating the right amount of memory here. I'll just malloc one, like one megabyte, and people can store the password in there. Nobody has a password longer than one megabyte. That's probably true, right? And you think, well, the worst that can happen is sec faults, right? 
But turns out if somebody writes like a little more than one megabyte, they might be overriding a pointer to some very important piece of code that will then be executed. And if they put that code in this one megabyte, they can execute their own code. And now your software is doing whatever they want your software to do. And that's what we call uh, an exploit, right? The, like the ability to take software and make it do something else through vulnerability. Um, so having done that, first of all, gives you like a super cool feeling of like, oh my God, I'm doing magic with this computer again, which you first get when you start coding, but then it fades, right? Because you know how to do it. You're like, ah, oh, whatever. Pointers, I know them. Now you're using pointers against the, like, against the system, and that's like pretty cool. But also it gives you a lot of awareness of good security practices, and you can, like it's very, very, very useful in your career if you're doing software development to be the person that knows about security. At least for me, it was super useful. Uh, like people will come to you and be like, hey, I have this design, but like what if this or that? And you, know, you get to talk to a lot of people about a lot of interesting stuff and provide very valuable advice. Because many developers are not trained in security, and I think that's a damn shame. Um, because they will make these mistakes like with the best of intentions, and they will never realize they're actually like doing something that is dangerous. So being the person that can help like fix things, well, maybe it will get you frustrated because you'll see people making the same mistakes again and again for your whole career, mm -hmm. but at least you'll be doing something for the greater good. Um, guys, uh, we have a bunch of questions from home, and we have uh, eight minutes. I was hoping that maybe we can run through them and you can give short answers or so. Sure, yeah. Would you feel comfortable? If you, have, um, if you have just an encrypted file, how would you guess the type of encryption used? So uh, the short answer is typically like software will put a header saying, hey, this is um, AES encrypted file. But if you don't have that, a good encryption algorithm will make the ciphertext indis indistinguishable from random noise. Um, if you have an algorithm that gives you the data, some data and there are statistical patterns in there that are noticeable, it's probably not a good algorithm and you shouldn't be using it. So the answer is you don't. You, you don't know uh, what, the, like, what the algorithm is. When people are searching and gathering prime numbers, like some distributed projects do, can't those primes be used to break RSA? Um, they might. Uh, they also used to make it possible to have larger key sizes for RSA, making it harder to break things. The thing is, like, prime numbers are known, right? Like, there are tables of prime numbers up to 32 bits, 64 bits, maybe not, but, like, whatever. You can download them and just use them. And if you have a big enough, like, cluster of computers, you could also remake that table. There's nothing secret about them. What is expensive is you have to try all of these prime numbers in sequence in order to find factors of something. And that's where factoring becomes uh, difficult and expensive. Uh, there are a couple of uh, questions re uh, related to XOR. In case of XOR cipher, would it be safe if we make use of a random number generator and exchange just the seeds and an offset instead of sending random data? Um, so the problem with that is uh, it boils down to a thing we call entropy. Um, but basically, if your seeds are maybe 32 bits, you only have 32 bits of entropy, which means there's only 2, deep, two to the power of 32 sequences of random numbers that can come out of that generator, even if that generator is perfect. And you will, like, people might be able to figure that out because you will not generate more randomness out of this. Like, randomness has to come from somewhere, but math don't make random stuff appear, right? So random number generators are useful because they give you something that is unpredictable, but from a cryptographic point of view, you have to be very careful how you use them because you cannot add more randomness to the system if it doesn't have it. Thank you. Uh, I think maybe you already addressed this, but in case if students didn't get it, with the XOR algorithm, 0, 0 becomes 1, and 1, 1 also. How do you know if it was a 0 or a 1 before? Um, so, yeah, so actually 0, 0 becomes 0, 1, 1 becomes 0, 0, 1 becomes 1, and 1, oh. 0 becomes 1, but that's fine. Um, you know that because, um, I mean, I, sh I showed the example earlier, right? Uh, you, don't, you don't know that. That's the, that's the point. You don't know if the input was a 0, like if it was 0, 0, or 1, 1. If you could know, it wouldn't be a very good encryption at all. Um, but you can decrypt because you're reusing the same key after, so you have the ciphertext and the key, and zoning them together gives you the clear text back. 
Is the existing, uh, existing encryption algorithm secure enough in the both security and performance perspectives, or do we need the new encryption concept? Um, I, yeah. So, I do, okay, uh, I think the question is like, is crypto broken uh, right now? Like, and that's a valid question, right? Like, people ask this question all the time. Is, I mean, we don't typically ask, is cryptography broken as a field? But, like, is this algorithm broken? I mean, that depends. Like, typically, they don't break in the sense that, oh, I have a magic formula that will get me to clear text in no time. But we think about algorithms being broken as, turns out, with you know, this many megawatts of power um, powering a cluster of computer, I can decrypt this in less time than I thought, right? Uh, just because computers get more performance, and we have more computing power, and you can rent time from AWS if you want, or whatever. I mean, that's expensive, but like you could, right? Or um, when the PlayStation, I think, 3 came out, it had this super powerful CPU, and people made clusters of those to, like, among many other things, break encryption in some way. So at the moment, there, there is guidance, and typically uh, things like NIST publish guidance on if you're encrypting, you should use this algorithm with this key size. Key size is also very important, right? If your key is short, it's much easier to figure that out than if your key is longer. And so there is guidance on, well, if you want this to be robust against a nation state attacker, which is kind of you know, considered the gold standard in terms of uh, resilience, you should uh, use these algorithms with these key sizes and maybe these considerations. Like maybe you need to use that in a certain way in order to guarantee certain properties of the crypto system. But we, I don't think we need a new encryption concept, although this is also a question of like post-quantum, right? Uh, quantum computers will change the game, and probably they will happen. Like we have small quantum computers, we'll have bigger ones eventually. Uh, that will make encryption different. Thank you. And uh, how do you feel about blockchain enthusiasms and crypto? <laughs> Just very I, I hate that crypto has been co-opted <laughs> to talk about cryptocurrency and not about cryptography in general because that confuses people a lot. Uh, in fact, I gave this same talk at another school in France, and they actually gave a weird intro. They were like, and no, are going to talk about cryptocurrencies? I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, but I mean, you know, that ship has sailed, right? People say crypto to mean different things. It's just an overloaded term, and you have to say cryptography or cryptocurrency if you want to clarify it. Um, does the NSA control, monitor all the Tor exit nodes? Well, I don't think they control all of them. Um, but, I mean, obviously, if you're like the NSA or like some like public agency that has an interest in people doing illegal things over a covert network, yeah, you're probably going to do that, right? So it's a game of numbers. Um, one thing I want to point out is that Tor doesn't actually need stuff to exit the Tor network. You can actually host stuff that stays on the Tor network itself, which makes this a lot more resilient. Um, if you want to look about how like hidden services have worked in the past and how Silk Roads was operating and like other very legal things, um, yeah, Google Silk Roads, you'll find interesting stuff there. And the last two, please, guys, don't add more questions, okay? So I'm just taking the two where they mention about how they can actually communicate with you. Uh, easiest way is uh, my email, which is not actually on this slide, but it is my first name at my last name .fr for friends. Yeah, okay, that's an easy one. And for the Codam students, you can find Uriel in Slack. Very oh, yeah, simple. also, the, yeah, I'm, I'm on the uh, Codam friends, friends Slack. So, so yes. And... I do have actually a last question again, sure. you know, because I have the microphone, fantastic. <laughs> um, a Viking with a big hammer and a French accent told me that you have a funky story behind your hoodie. Would you feel comfortable sharing it? This one, oh yeah. So I mentioned I was a student at Epitech, uh, like actually like I graduated, I graduated 11 years ago. But I spent a lot of time uh, as a teaching assistant there and I was, very active teaching C++, among many other things. And the team that was teaching C++ at the time was led by David, who's the current Codem director. Uh, and that was uh, the hoodies for the people from that team. So um, I, I know he still has one. I don't know if he wears it here. It probably does, <laughs> no, right? No, he never. Yeah. No, I think he's uh, undercover. Something. Oh, really? Yeah, like he doesn't want to show it off. Like, those hoodies are also really, really good. Like this is It's 11 been 11 years. years. And it's still, <laughs> Look at it. <laughs> it's it's still, still like good. It's actually more than 11 years old. And, but 
I know some friends were like, this is so good, but they finally get, uh, gave in. Like, the, the hoodie's dead. So I actually tracked the supplier to find the same hoodies, and we're going to have another reprint. Because <laughs> they're just so comfortable and, and yeah. like, good quality. Thank you so much, Uriel. Let's give a round of applause to Uriel. <laughs>